Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Pastor Michael Jakes, and welcome to the Cutting It Right Bible Study. Once again, coming to you with a word for your heart and for your soul. We pray that all is well with you tonight as we enter into uh, this particular Bible study. Uh, we pray that you'll take the time out to join us. And if you're watching over Facebook, uh, we pray that you'll take the time out uh, to share uh, this page uh, right now. Uh, we are right now, we are streaming live over Facebook and YouTube, Periscope slash Twitter and on Spreaker.com. Spreaker.com is our podcast platform. If you go there, you will find all of the podcasts that we do produce and have produced over the years. We pray that you will take the time out uh, to do so. Uh, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And without him, we could do absolutely nothing nothing so we bless him and we honor him for who he is you can also find all of our podcasts if you like to listen in once again or go back and listen to one of our uh one of our studies that we have done in the past you can go to spotify apple Podcasts, google Podcasts. you can go to itunes iHeartRadio, radio cast box podcast addict and all the major uh podcast platforms you'll find us there you can also go to our website at that's the word.org and do not forget to go to our YouTube channel, which is That's The Word Ministries. Or you can just type in Pastor Michael Jakes. That'll bring you right there to our page on YouTube. Amen. And so we honor him. We bless the name of the Lord. We thank him for all that he has done. We are currently, we are currently in the last legs. And I must say we are in the final installment uh, of our series entitled Churchianity, Examining the line between religion and relationship. It's been a powerful ride. And tonight we want to lay out the hard facts. Yes, the hard facts about religion, about relationship, about fellowship, uh, about the unsaved Christian, about spiritual awakening and what needs to happen to get us out of this mess of religion. Because religion, religion is actually a terrible thing thing ladies and gentlemen and so tonight we are going to lay it all out in a in a in one way it'll be a review and another way we're going to reveal some new things that we have yet uh spoken on this particular topic amen and so once again if you're watching over facebook take the time out to share this page if you're watching over periscope you can retweet that others also uh may be a part of this particular study tonight amen don't forget you can go over to Amazon.com and pick up a copy of our book entitled The Lights in the Windows. The Lights in the Windows, it's all about evangelism and the need for the church to get back to the business of evangelizing. When we say business, we're not talking about business in the usual manner. The work of the church is to evangelize. Jesus said to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And that is what we are to do until he comes. That is what we are to occupy ourselves in doing. And so this book talks about that need to go back to the place where we belong, and that's evangelism. Once again, it's available on Amazon.com, the lights in the windows, amen? We're going to pray, and we're going to get right into our study tonight. We have a lot to cover, and so we want to get right into it. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you once again for giving us an opportunity to bless your name. Lord, we pray that you will be with us as we open up your word tonight. Lord, we know that this particular topic uh, is a hot topic. Lord, we know that there may be some controversy uh, surrounding this topic. But Lord, we're not intending to uh, incite controversy, but we are simply uh, desiring to lay forth the truth. So Lord, have your way. Uh, be with us as we open up your word. Lord, you be the teacher, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you will draw those who need to hear this word tonight to this place on the World Wide Web. So, Lord, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. Once again, uh, we want to shout out to those of you who do listen in over Spreaker.com. Once again, that is our podcast platform. Those who do listen in over Spreaker, they listen in from across the United States. And as we always say, around the world. And we know that they're there. And we thank you all for your support. Amen. Well, it has been a fascinating ride, this particular uh, study uh, this particular series that we have been on, uh, we have talked about Churchianity 101. We've talked about the most dangerous verses in the Bible, which we will uh, speak about once again tonight. Uh, we talked about the plight of the unsaved Christian. Uh, and last week we talked about, are you awake or are you abiding? Amen. And that was pretty much all about uh, the idea, the, the truth of a spiritual awakening. Uh, tonight, once again, we want to talk about the hard facts. What are the hard facts? Hard facts. 
What is the truth about this thing that we call religion? That I do believe that many are caught up in. Many are caught up in this thing called religion. It is, decept it is deceptive and it will bring you to hell. Yes, religion can bring you to hell. You say, oh, Pastor Michael, what are you talking about? Yes, religion can bring you to hell. So let's first talk about what religion is as we talk about the hard facts, the hard facts about religion. Religion is a series of man-made, now that's very important to remember, religion is a series of man-made procedures that satisfies the heart into thinking that spiritual growth is taking place. That's the definition that we've been working from when we've talked about a religion. Man-made procedures that satisfy the heart and deceive the heart into thinking that spiritual growth is taking place. That's the first fact about religion, the first hard fact. The second hard fact about religion is that it stifles, it frustrates the Holy Ghost by causing people to believe here it comes, that a dance, that a shout, uh, that these things are all it takes to please God. In other words, the outward activity, the outward activity. Religion is based on the outward activity of an individual. It is released on the outward activity of a particular church. So we must move ourselves away from religion because those things though they may have their place though they may have their place those things are not what define what a true Christian is all about a true Christian is not defined by how much they dance a true Christian is not defined by how much they dance and shout uh, a true Christian is not defined by how much they wave their hands or how much they jump these are not the things that define what a true Christian is all about those things are quite and very much minimal when it comes to the true Christian life. Thirdly, hard fact about religion. Religion provides a, a false sense of security by giving you something you believe that you can depend on that makes you right with God. I'm doing all of these things and because I am doing all of these things, God accepts me. He receives me as I am because look what I do. Look what I do. This is a problem. It's not about what you do. It's about who you know and where is your faith. If you're putting your faith in the things that you do, let's, let's repeat. Let's be redundant here. If you are putting your faith in the fact that you dance and you shout and you wave your hands and you jump, and all of the outward manifestations, if you're putting your faith in those things, then you have placed your faith in the wrong place. That's not where your faith goes. Don't trust in those things. Let me take it a little further. Don't put your faith in the fact that you read your Bible every day. Don't place your faith in the fact that you fast for however many days. Don't place your faith, don't place your faith in the fact of uh, all of these things. That is not those are not the things that make a Christian. It is about your faith. Reading your Bible, fasting, praying, all of these things are vital. They are absolutely vital and absolutely necessary for the Christian life. And so they are to be done. We call those the Christian disciplines. You need to do them. You better do them. But once again, what we are simply saying is do not put your faith in the doing of these disciplines. Okay? Don't put your faith there. Your faith is in Christ and what he has accomplished for us on the cross. That's where your faith belongs. Not in the things that you do. Period. Not in the things that you do. Finally, or almost finally, fourth fact, third fact, fourth fact, about religion. Hard fact. Religion is like a drug. It is like a drug. Religion is the most powerful narcotic that there is uh, because it fills you, once again, with a false sense of who you are. 
It gives you a high, so to speak. It makes you come out of yourself. It makes you believe something about yourself that is not true. That's what religion does. Now, we're going to give you some scripture in just a little bit to, to, say, to show you where we're coming from. But this, these are the hard facts about religion. Finally, religion coddles you. And once again, this goes along with the fact that religion uh, gives you a false sense of security. Religion coddles you and it cuddles you and it soothes, it soothes you and it whispers, it whispers sweet, deceptive things in your ear. Things like, you're okay. It whispers things like, you're doing a good job. Religion whispers in your ear, keep up the good work. And religion once again causes you to give yourself a pat on the back. Because you begin to believe these deceptive words. Okay? All the while not realizing that this thing that you have now plunged yourself into, religion, is blinding you. It is binding you and leaving you totally unaware, totally oblivious of your true spiritual condition. It's a powerful narcotic. And it lulls you to sleep spiritually. I'm okay. Look what I have done. Look what I do. God is pleased with me. That is the deception of religion. And those are the hard facts about religion. The hard facts. Now, talking about religion, ultimately, Na uh, naturally bring you to a discussion about the unsaved Christian. Who is the unsaved Christian? Once again, this is something that is not possible. It is not possible to be unsaved and be a Christian at the same time. We've explained this ad nauseum, but we will, once again, tonight we will be redundant. We will repeat ourselves. The unsaved Christian is an individual who in their heart of hearts for all that they know and for all that they believe, they are a Christian. An unsaved Christian is not a hypocrite. A hypocrite is an individual who is wearing a mask intentionally. That's what the word hypocrite means in the Bible. Someone who is an actor, someone who's putting on uh, that mask and they're trying to show you something about themselves that is not true. That's the definition of a hypocrite in the Bible. The unsaved Christian that's not where they are. They truly believe, the unsaved Christian truly believes that they are born again. They have been brought to that conclusion by several factors which we will speak about as we move along tonight. But the unsaved Christian is not who they think they are. And it is a terrible, terrible place to be. Several things, several hard facts about the unsaved Christian. Number one, the unsaved Christian has misinterpreted scripture. The unsaved Christian has misinterpreted scripture. Because once again, they have believed by holding on to the law or the things that you that they do, uh, and that by engaging in more and more, by doing more and more, and that it makes them holy or righteous somehow in God's sight. It puts them in a good standing with God. And this, once again, is a misinterpretation of scripture. We are to work. We are to do. We are to go about doing the work of the Lord. But we have to be qualified. We have to be qualified to do the work of the Lord. Secondly, the unsaved Christian has misunderstood the blessings of God. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He's healed my body and he's done all these things for me. They have, been, they, 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 have, they have equated their increased goods and possessions to mean that they have gotten God's approval. Just because you are blessed does not mean that God has put a seal of approval on your life. And this is what has happened to the unsaved Christian. For the most part, these are individuals uh, whom the Lord... who who are aware of who the Lord is. Aware of, and we're going to talk about that too as we move along tonight. They are aware of who the Lord is. They are aware of the things that he has spoken, the things that he has done. 
And even the things that he that they ascribe uh, glory to him or responsibility for in their own lives. But yet, they still fall short. They still fall short of an actual relationship with the Lord. The unsaved Christians are self-satisfied and self-reliant. Very much like the, the Christians, uh, those in the church at Laodicea in the book of Revelation. They, they are rich and increased with goods and they say they have need of nothing. That is a, a profile of the unsaved Christian. They're good. I'm okay the way I am. Finally, and most sadly, the unsaved Christian has misdiagnosed their spiritual condition. They have misdiagnosed their spiritual condition. What do we mean by that? They have become, to their own shame, they have become unaware of their true spiritual state. They were unaware. They are unaware. Just like the those in Laodicea. They did not understand exactly who they were. They thought they were here, but they were not there. They were very much down there, wherever down there is. But they were not who they thought they were. Something else needed to happen. We're going to talk about what needs to happen to those who are in this condition as we move along tonight. But that is, those are the hard facts about the unsaved Christian. But there are more. The unsaved Christian has God consciousness. They have a reverence for God. They are quick to connect the hand of the Lord to the affairs of this life. They know when the Lord has moved and they will stand up and testify as to the goodness and grace of God in their life. They can do that. Secondly, the unsaved Christian has God's speech. God's speech. In other words, they have the knowledge and ability to speak Christianese. You say, what is Christianese? Christianese is the ability to say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, bless the Lord on my soul. They know the language of Christianity. They know the songs of Christianity. They know how to carry themselves in the house of God and amongst uh, God's people. That is the unsaved Christian. Thirdly, the unsaved Christian has God busyness. And we've spoken about this already. They have this God activity and God movement taking place in their life. They do just enough to make themselves believe enough that the Lord is satisfied enough. Let me repeat that. The unsaved Christian, they do enough to make themselves believe enough that the Lord is satisfied enough with their lives. That's the unsaved Christian. And so we need to steer far away from those who are in this boat, but there is a way out. There is a way out. Now, once again, tonight, uh, we're talking about uh, the hard facts, the hard facts about religion and, and the unsaved Christian, the hard facts about churchianity and religiosity. Now, when we speak, speak about hard facts, uh, we're talking about information that is true and that cannot be refuted and in our case, must not be avoided. These are truths that must not be avoided. So we've spoken so far about the hard facts about religion, and we've just finished speaking about the hard facts about the unsaved Christian. Now, let's look at some scripture verses here, because when we go to scripture, uh, we get a fuller picture of what the Lord, uh, what we are talking about when we talk about the unsaved Christian. I want to take you to uh, our powerful verse, that verse that we've been going to just about every week since we've been on this subject, and that is Matthew uh, chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7. And in Matthew chapter number 7, Jesus gives us a profile of these individuals who are religious and unsaved. Now, let me just make a slight departure. Now, we're talking about the unsaved Christian. But the Christian, the true, genuine, born-again, blood-washed Christian can also find themselves immer immersed into religion. This does not remove them from salvation. Jesus does not snatch uh, their redemption away. But a true Christian can also find themselves smack dab in the middle of this thing called religion. 
the same way that the unsaved Christian does, by taking their faith away from Christ and what he has done and putting their faith in what they do. And we'll go to we'll go to we'll go to Galatians chapter number 20 and uh, 2 and 20 and 21 to explain this uh, later on. But this can also happen. This thing called religion can happen to the genuine Christian. But here we're speaking about Jesus as he spoke to those who were not saved, who were not saved. Here's what Here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter number 7 starting in verse number 21. And once again, if you've been with us for these several weeks, you've heard us say these scriptures each week because they are paramount. They are important and they need these scriptures need to be in our heart because these once again, these three scriptures, we've already pointed them out. These are the most dangerous verses in the Bible. These verses can cause you, should cause you to examine yourselves. The Bible says that we should examine ourselves. And these verses will do it. Matthew chapter number 7, starting in verse number 21. Jesus speaking, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So the only person... The only person uh, who will enter into heaven are those who are doing the will of the Father. And now we're going to read a verse that seems to say, that seems to tell us that these individuals are doing the will of the Father. Look what they do. Verse number 22, many will say to me in that day, many, that's something that we cannot avoid, that he says many. So there are many individuals who are in this particular place they are in this state they are living in this state even as we speak he says many will come to me in that day and say lord lord have we not prophesied in thy name we have proclaimed your name we have lifted up your name surely this is the will of god number two and in thy name have cast out devils or demons Surely, this is the will and work of God. Thirdly, it says, And in thy name have done many wonderful works. In other words, they perform miracles in the name of Jesus. So three works, three things that we see in this verse number 22 that were done by these individuals that can be qualified as the will of God. He says those who will enter in the kingdom of heaven are only those who do the will of the Father. Surely, surely proclaiming his name and casting out demons and performing miracles are God's will. But here's what Jesus says. And then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What happened there? What happened? They were not qualified to do what they did. Therefore, what they believed they did, they did not do. No one who is unsaved, no one who does not have the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, no one who does not have the divine nature can do these things. They were under a very massive deception. They were self-deceived. Somehow, they had been brought to a place where they thought they were doing the will of God. They rested their hopes on their works completely. They rested their hopes upon their works and they made a grave mistake. So once again, that is the peril and the plight of the unsaved Christian. Now, how do you get back? How do you get back? To the place where you need to be. How do you enter into fellowship with the Lord? Fellowship, true fellowship. Now, listen, the Bible, in the Bible, you will not. We talk about religion versus relationship. You will not find the word relationship as it pertains to our walk with the Lord in the Bible. You will not find it. 
You go to your concordance, you go to your Bible dictionary, you will not find the word relationship. So what do we mean by religion versus relationship? You see, relationship speaks about fellowship. All right? It speaks about fellowship. The Bible says that we ought to have fellowship with him. When we go to uh, the book of Revelation, let's go to the book of Revelation, uh, chapter number 3. Revelation chapter number 3 and verse number 20. It's a very uh, very familiar portion of scripture. But it's Jesus speaking. Here's what he says. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Ladies and gentlemen, that is fellowship. That is fellowship. When we open up the door, and here it is speaking of the door to our lives, the door to our hearts. When we open up this door, when we allow him in, when we say yes to Jesus, the Bible says that he will come in. Here's where it begins. Here's where relationship and fellowship begins. He will come in to us and he will sup. I'm reading from the King James Version, and that means that he simply will dine with us. He will sit down and communicate with us. He will have a relationship with us. This is fellowship. This is what we mean by having a relationship with the Lord. It's all wrapped up in that word fellowship. And this is where we need to be. But how do we get there? How do we get to this place called relationship with the Lord? Well, it starts It starts with something called a spiritual awakening. A spiritual awakening. Now you say, what is a spiritual awakening? Well, let's give you some hard facts. Some hard facts about spiritual awakening and what spiritual awakening is not. Well, let me just start from the top. Spiritual awakening, as you will see, as we define it and give you the hard facts, you will see that a spiritual awakening is not, I repeat, is not salvation. A spiritual awakening is not salvation. Let's look at the hard facts about a spiritual awakening. Here's what a spiritual awakening will do. Spiritual awakening will draw you to God. It will draw you to God. That's good. That is good. That's what needs to happen. You need to be drawn. In order to be saved, in order to be born again, in order to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to be drawn to God. The Bible says in John 6, 44, uh, that no man can come to me except the Father draw him. Let's read what it says. Let's read the words of Jesus. I just said it, but let me make sure I say it absolutely right. John Chapter number six and verse number 44, Jesus speaking. Here's what he says. No man can come to me except the father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. So you come to him, you give your life to him. He saves you. Your salvation is complete. You are sealed in by the Holy Ghost and at the last day, he will lift you up. Okay? That, that is what we mean by being drawn. Now, secondly, second hard fact about a spiritual awakening. It brings you to an awareness and it causes you to fear God. I put fear in quotations. It causes you to be aware of death. It may even cause you to be aware of the devil. And it may even cause you to be aware of your own mortality. You know, what we're dealing with in these days, we are living in very uncertain and unprecedented times. We've never seen the likes of what we are seeing uh, in these days. And for many, it's a wake-up call. It is definitely a wake-up call to the church. But it is also a wake-up call to all those who are outside of the safety of the ark. All of those who do not know the Lord, all of those who are teetering on the fence, all of those who are not sure 
whether they are in Christ or not, it's causing them and it ought to cause them to think. If there are those who are listening and hearing me tonight, watching me, and you are in this category of the unsaved Christian, then pay careful attention to what's going on around you. Because if death catches any one who is an unsaved Christian and they don't know the Lord, whether we are living it, whether it was for this, uh, uh, this virus that's going around or not, if an unsaved Christian passes away in that condition, they are not a Christian. They are not a Christian. And we need to make sure, once again, Examine yourselves whether you are in the faith. So a spiritual awakening, hard fact number one, is that a spiritual awakening will draw you to the Lord. Number two, spiritual awakening will cause you to fear God, be aware of your own mortality, give you an awareness even probably of Satan. And all of these things are good. These are good. They are starting points. Third thing, a spiritual awakening will start you to work hard at living right by not doing certain things. It's an awareness that sin is killing you. I should not do this. I cannot do that. I'm going to stop doing this and that. That is what a spiritual awakening will do. It causes you to be aware of your own sinfulness. This is good. This is good. A spiritual awakening, because it has that phrase, spiritual, and that means that the Holy Spirit is involved. The Holy Spirit is involved in the spiritual awakening. But the whole, the whole divine process of spiritual awakening must be brought to its conclusion. And the conclusion of spiritual awakening is that it needs to lead the individual into salvation. When the person who has been spiritually awakening stops there, they're still not saved. They're still not saved. Okay, hard fact number four. The, the person who has been spiritually awakening, uh, spiritually awakened, they begin coming to church in many cases. They start their regimen of church going. I'm in church. I'm here. I'm doing good. See, spiritual awakening, unfortunately, for many, it begins to be a leaf turned over. You've heard the phrase, turning over a new leaf, a new lease on life. These are things associated with a spiritual awakening. You see, spiritual with a spiritual awakening, the individual adds Jesus to their life. And you might say, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with adding Jesus to your life? The problem with adding Jesus to your life is that Jesus, and here it comes, he, he, we, 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 we'll, get, we'll get pushed back. Jesus did not come to make your life better. He came to give you a brand new life. Brand new life. In Christ, you are a new creature. It's not the addition to, we don't just add Jesus to our life. I'm going to pick up Jesus and start doing Jesus things now. No. We need to receive him into our hearts and we become a new creature in him. We are baptized into Christ when we get saved. We're not talking about water baptism. We are baptized into Christ when we become born again. Here's the fifth hard fact about a spiritual awakening. It starts us on the road to working hard and then worrying about whether you have done enough to merit God's grace. You see, there is never... There is no, when it comes to religion and being the unsaved Christian, uh, you are never fully satisfied. You don't know if you've done enough. And so since you don't know if you've done enough, you do more. You do more. I got to work harder. I got to pray harder. I got to fast longer. I, I, I need to be there more. All of these things are associated with the life of religion. And religion, once again, is a hard task master. It is a hard task master. Let's look at number six. A spiritual awakening will give you the desire to want to do things differently. I'm going to do right. I'm going to be right. I'm going to talk right. I'm going to act right. 
That's the mindset of an individual who has been spiritually awakened. And let's repeat once again, we're being redundant tonight. We know that. But it is necessary because the un the rather the person who is spiritually awakened has not yet become born again. They've not yet become born again. The person who is has been spiritually awakened may begin their regimen of prayer. A regimen of prayer. Listen, I've heard the prayers of individuals who are not saved. Not saved. And it's obvious that they're not saved. But I've heard the prayers of people who are not saved that rival those of powerful men and women of God. But once again, they're not saved. So there has to be a problem with that. They're not saved. Finally, the person who is spiritually awakened may begin to give to the Lord. To give to the Lord. To give their tithe. To give money to the church. Once again, believing that doing these things somehow puts God in a frame of mind that he accepts you because you give money to the church. Once again, it's deception. Spiritual awakening is not meant to be deception. But when people are awakened spiritually and stop at the door and don't enter in to salvation, they become religious. They become religious. And this is a problem. And so how do you get back? We need to open the door and let Jesus in. What needs to happen as we close out our session for tonight, what needs to happen, the religious person, the unsaved Christian, they need to have what we call that wretched man moment. That wretched man moment. It's that moment when you realize that you are not who you think you are. It's, it's that moment when you realize that you are a sinner. You see, I told you, I believe it was last time we got together, I told you about my, my testimony about I lived and I, I walked around in a, state of, in a state of conviction for several months before I gave my heart to the Lord. Several months because I was fighting with this idea of being a sinner. I just didn't think that I was a sinner. But the Lord brought me to that point where I surrendered and submitted myself to him. It was a spiritual fight. I didn't know anything about it being a spiritual fight. I can look back now and tell you that it was a spiritual fight. But I had to come. The Holy Ghost had to bring me to the knowledge of the truth and let me know that I was truly a sinner. And once this was accomplished, then I was able to go through the door. I had been awakened spiritually. I hadn't started to do the God things. I was in church every week, but I wasn't involved in any ministry. I do believe I may have been in a choir, in a youth choir at that time, but that's it. But I wasn't, I, I was not saved. But once my heart was given to the Lord, this, this is when everything opened up. When I said yes to Jesus, then I entered into relationship with the Lord. We need to have that wretched man moment. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, near the end of the chapter, his oh wretched man that I am, who shall, who, shall, who shall separate me from this body of death? You see, he realized the things that he was doing, and he was saved at the time. See, Paul was saved at that particular time. But he entered into this place of wretchedness where he, where he ran into a wall spiritually, he could not live like that anymore. The unsaved Christian, the unsaved Christian, the religious person has to come to a point in their life where they realize they can't live that way anymore. That there's something missing. You see, the most difficult people, the most difficult individuals to get the truth across to, the truth about Jesus and the truth about their own condition are those who have been spiritually awakened, number two, and those who are religious. They are the most difficult people to tell the truth to because they already believe that they're living and walking in the truth. And so it's only by
by an act of the Holy Ghost that an individual can come out of that deception. It's only by submitting yourself and coming to the conclusion, Lord, save me. Lord, I want your truth. Save me. You see, here's what relationship, here, here's what a personal relationship is. It, is. it means to trust fully in Jesus Christ, to trust fully in him, and then live to please him. It means to confess your sins, to repent, and then yield yourself to Jesus. It, it comes by the power of the Holy Spirit, and it is him who does the work in us and through us. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to control and direct our lives. And the results, the results will be love and joy and peace and freedom and victory and power and eternal life in heaven. That is what results from relationship, true relationship with the Lord. See, on the other hand, you have what we've been talking about tonight. You have religion. You have religion. Which, is, which the goal of religion is to reach out to God and try to work your way into heaven. Secondly, the means, the way that religion works is by diligent service, diligent work with the hopes of a reward in heaven. You are not sure. Third, the power behind religion is a good, honest self-effort through self-determination. I think I can. I think I can. I know I can. I will. That's religion. The control behind religion is simply self-motivation and self-control. Yes, I can. Finally, the results of religion will be apathy, failure, chronic guilt, never knowing if you've done enough, an eternal separation from God for those who are actually unsaved. For those who are saved, it will it will result in apathy, failure, chronic chronic guilt, and just a lack of satisfaction. A lack of satisfaction. You see, we go to Galatians. We'll close. We'll close in Galatians chapter number two. Galatians chapter number two. And we'll go to verse number 20. Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number 20. This is Paul the Apostle speaking. This is where the person who is in relationship with Jesus Christ needs to be. That's talking about myself. This is where we need to be as Christians who are actually walking with the Lord. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice what he said. I live this life by faith of or in the son of God. Faith in Christ. That's the Christian life. Not faith in my works. Remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For we are, for we are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. It's not about works. It's not about what you do. It's not about how much you do what you do. It's about faith in the Son of God. Verse number 21, Galatians 2 and 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If you can be righteous... If you can be holy simply, simply by doing more, then there's no need for Christ to come. And this is where those who are religious and the unsaved Christian even, this is where they have fallen short. This is where they have been deceived. They have come to that conclusion that by doing righteousness, by simply following and keeping the law, that's good enough. It's not good enough. You need to enter into relationship with Jesus Christ. So those are the hard facts. That's how we get back to the place where we belong in Christ. If you're not saved, you need to enter in to Christ. If you're not sure, you need to enter in to Christ. 
If you know nothing about the Lord, you need to enter in to Christ, especially in these uncertain times that we're living in today. Well, we're going to pray and we're going to invite you to come to Christ. If you don't know the Lord, maybe you are, maybe you've been brought to a place even through what we've spoken tonight. Maybe you've been brought to a place to understand that maybe you're not saved. Maybe you're not, you know that you do attend church, you go to church and, and you're involved in things in the church. Maybe you're involved in ministry, but you don't have the, the assurance that you have the Lord in your life, that he's in your heart, that his spirit is working in you. We're going to pray. Lord, we bless your name tonight. We thank you once again for giving us this opportunity to bless your name. Lord, we know that there are many, Jesus said that there are many who will come to him in that day and say, Lord, Lord, there are many who are doing and doing and doing, but they still don't know you, but they don't know it. Lord, we ask for simple conviction, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you will align those who believe that they know you, Lord. I pray that you will align them with yourself. Lord, cause them to see the truth about themselves, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that even right now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit might bring them to a conviction, Lord Jesus, that they will not be able to refute, that they will not be able to turn away. Lord, I pray that you will have your, have your way in their hearts and lives. Lord, bless them, Lord. Lord, I pray you'll save them even right now. Have your way. If you don't know the Lord, just speak these simple words. Pray these simple words. It's by faith. It is by faith. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I thank you for dying for me. Lord, I sense your presence. Lord, I ask for your Holy Spirit to come live inside of me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done. I am your child. In Jesus' name, amen. We bless the name of the Lord. Amen. So we bless the Lord and we thank him for all that he has done, for all that he is doing. Amen. This is That's the Word Ministry. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes, and we come to you every week uh, with a Bible study for your soul. Uh, you can find us. You can find uh, our our podcast streaming on Facebook and YouTube, Periscope and Twitter, and on Spreaker.com. That is our podcast platform. We have several other podcasts that we do produce. Uh, we pray that you will take the time out to go and to go over to Spreaker.com. And shout out to all of those who do listen in on Spreaker.com from across the United States and around the world. We thank you for all of your support. Amen. You can also find all of our, if you'd like to go back and listen to any of our uh, other uh, podcasts, you can go to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, CastBox, Podcast Addicts, and all the major podcast platforms. Amen. So we bless the name of the Lord. You can also go uh, to our website at that's the word.org and never forget our YouTube channel, that's the Word Ministries, amen? And you can go there and you'll find all of our podcasts and many videos. We have well over a thousand uh, items there for your perusal. And we pray that you'll be blessed by subscribing to the channel. Don't forget to go over to Amazon.com and pick up a copy of our book entitled The Lights in the Windows. It's all about evangelism and the need for the church to get back to doing what it was meant to do. And that is evangelize amen so we bless the name of the lord now don't forget you can join us that's the word ministry you can join us this sunday morning right here on facebook youtube periscope twitter spreaker.com you can tune in on sunday morning for the sunday sermon we'll be here at 11 30 a.m uh with another word for your heart another word for your soul you have many choices there are many churches now that are online and have been online uh if you want a simple powerful but practical word uh for your life uh we invite you to join us once again 11 30 sunday morning for the that's the word ministries sunday sermon amen we know we believe that you will be blessed by doing so amen so next week we're going to start a brand new series uh on the cutting it right bible study our new series is entitled take us back God's Blueprint for Revival. It's going to be a powerful uh, several-part series all about the need, once again, for revival. We need for the Lord to take us back to the place where we first 
received him. Oh yes, we need to go back there and we'll talk about God's blueprint for revival. Amen. So join us next Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Amen. So once again, this is me, that's you. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time on the podcast. May God bless you. 